Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining me. My name is Ian Blackburn. This is another Wednesday edition of Zoom into Wine, and Learn About Wine is presenting Italy tonight. If for whatever reason you fall off the Zoom, you're having issues or technical issues, we are also simulcasting this, I believe, uh, on Facebook. At this time, you can go to the Merchant of Wine on Facebook, and you can watch it over there. Every Wednesday night, we intend to continue to bring great content to your home and deliver great wine. And uh, we have a really robust calendar of Zooms uh, scheduled out through right now, the end of June, and we're continuing to produce those. So take a look at the Zoom into Wine calendar and thank you for joining us tonight. There's a chat, bu chat box at the bottom of the screen. And if any of you would like to um, inject a question, um, you're welcome to come on when I, when I ask the audience if you would like to ask anything and just talk to me, or you could send a little chat there. I'd love to hear what you're thinking about each of the wines as well. Now, sometimes when we do Zoom into Wine, we're able to have a few live guests, but Italy and the time zone is uh, pretty... Uh, different. So uh, I think, believe right now it's like three or four in the morning in Italy. So I record each of the sessions and uh, we talk to them and we make a little edit to the video. Some of the videos turn out fantastic. Some of them are serviceable, but um, we will uh, learn quite a bit about some great wines tonight. And I kind of um, tonight show off a couple of really great value level wines. Uh, things that really kind of over deliver for the dollar. That's what Italy really does. Then they kind of crank up uh, on a couple of occasions into the better uh, wine qualities. Let's begin our program tonight. And I've got, uh, I do have us live on Facebook. You can now see yourself over there. And here's our slideshow. Let's begin. Um, First, uh, I'm, I love to travel, and Italy is one of my favorite destinations. I have been to all of these destinations, with the uh, exception of the first one, um, which is from Sardinia, and that is on the list. Um, but Italy is just an amazing country. It's like a series of countries. Um, kind of bonded together with the Italian language. There's different cuisines and different uh, dialects to that language all over um, Italy. And it really does have a very diverse set of grape varieties, um, uh, approximating 5,000 different grape varieties in Italy. Uh, so it can take a, a while to get to taste them all and probably never will. Um, there are even varieties that are kind of ancient varieties that are thought to be extinct, maybe uh, only a couple examples uh, living. There's some really interesting research uh, going on right now with, um, you know, with global warming. People are thinking maybe some of those ancient varieties would be better suited for the future of uh, grape growing. So they're doing a lot of research and rehabilitating a lot of ancient grape varieties. Many of them are currently, you know, very uh, minimal in production. Some of them are borderline uh, on the extinction path, um, but uh, they're playing with some of those and they're doing it in Spain. They're doing it in France. They're doing it in Italy for sure. Our first wine, we are going to be uh, visited by Oliver McCrum, who is a fantastic wine importer, and he has been a guest of ours on numerous occasions. He brings in some really important wines. And in fact, he brought in two of the wines that we're going to be tasting tonight. So we're going to start off in Sardinia with a little Vermentino. That is in vial number one. And um, let's get started. I'll introduce Mr. Oliver McCrum. Whenever I do a discussion or presentation on Italian wine, I make a consideration to importers and who the personalities are. And I'm very proud to introduce you all to Oliver McCrum, who is a really important importer from, from Italy. He brings in a magical set of wines that uh, carry a very high ethos and um, typically represents small family vineyard operators. 
um, some of some very important historical merit and some newer ideas. Uh, he's on the cutting edge and he's also representing some of the classics. So without uh, any further ado, I want to introduce Oliver McCrum and thank you for joining us to our with our Zoom today. Hi, Ian, and um, I'm delighted to join you and, and um, your customers uh, online. That's as good as it gets these days, really. <laughs> <laughs> so Oliver, we're going to present now Piero Mancini, which I carry two SKUs from um, the Vermentino and the Cannonau. Okay. Um, Mancini is is a producer that um, I was introduced to by a retail uh, a retailer when I was working in um, wholesale for another importer many 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 years ago. Uh, so Vermentino is the grape variety, uh, and Galora is the uh, the part of Sardinia that it comes from. Uh, Sardinia, of course, is uh, the island that you can see on the map there, which is a large. Uh, Mediterranean island um, just south of Corsica. This is a map of this of Italy, so you can't see Corsica, but Corsica would be immediately north of Sardinia. Um, it's a it's a very distinctive area from a wine standpoint. Um, it doesn't really have that much to do with the mainland, uh, and Vermentino is um, one of their main um, war horses, as the Italians say, one of their main uh, kind of flagship varieties. Um, this is a lovely photograph that shows uh, off in the distance there some of uh, Mancini's vineyards, um, which would be in this in this photograph would be uh, Vermentino, and this is an old house that they've restored that they used for uh, giving uh, vineyard lunches to people. I've spent a couple of lovely uh, um, lunch times there, uh, and you can see that the the stone there is is granite, and in fact this whole corner of the uh, island of Sardinia is one huge shield of granite, um, uh, everything from uh, decomposed granite that's very reminiscent of the Sierra Nevadas uh, to massive um, house-sized boulders, uh, but it's all granite pretty much as far as you can see. And this is just um, a delicious, Verm Vermentino is a semi-aromatic uh, grape variety, so it's not quite as distinctive as uh, varieties like Sauvignon Blanc and uh, Gewürztraminer or um, Muscat, but uh, it has a very distinct uh, aromatic character and it often reminds me of lemon peel. And um, it also is often very reminiscent of Mediterranean herbs, um, which I think is, is in great part because the vineyards, uh, the, excuse me, the countryside around that you can see off in the distance here, is what the um, Italians call a macchia, which is wild herbs, basically. So I, I suspect that the reason why the wine smells like uh, Herbe de Provence mixture is because, in fact, uh, the vineyard is surrounded by wild herbs and um, the oils from those herbs just gets blown straight onto the fruit. Uh, so I think it's just a physical process. It's uh, all um, fermented in stainless steel. So the winemaking would take place in those stainless steel tanks that we saw earlier. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been drinking this wine for about 30 years and um, very happily. Uh, it's a great general purpose food wine and, and great uh, aperitif also. There's Vermentino um, that comes in from Tuscany and other parts of um, um, uh, many different producers in different parts right. of the um, And in, uh, uh, in uh, France, they might call it Vermentino. Yeah, um, or, or a roll. It's right. also, right, it's also known in the south of France uh, as roll. And Vermentino might be a Corsican uh, name for it, but... Um, yeah, it's as you suggest, it's grown um, in several, it's traditional in several other regions, uh, coastal Tuscany and also uh, Liguria. We have a, also a producer from uh, from Liguria. Well, um, I, I like the this wine for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, you know, when you're trying to find great wines that are out of value to this over, over delivers, it's a great price point, um, super clean. Uh, there's always a freshness and island characteristic to the wines of Sardinia. 
Uh, you can almost smell the fresh ocean breezes mm -hmm. as you smell this glass of of, of wine. And I think uh, dollar for dollar, just a super uh, yeah, killer value proposition. So Oliver, here's our last uh, slide before we move along. Um, a beautiful uh, site, obviously. This is the um, side of, of uh, an old house that the uh, Mancini, the Alessandro Mancini has restored um, that's made of the granite that is, uh, is as I mentioned, um, the local, you know, all the stone that you see is, is granite. You can see that's what this house is made of. Um, and this is where they give vineyard lunches if um, if you have um, uh, lunch with them in the in the in the middle of the vineyard, this is where they give those lunches. It's a fantastic spot. All right, I'm gonna put that on my list. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, we'll take, we're gonna take a little break and uh, taste the wine now with our our live audience, and uh, we'll come right back and talk about uh, Montepulciano di Abruzzo. Whenever I do a discussion. All right, so this is a look at the wine that we just uh, tasted, uh, the slide here. Uh, it is 100% Vermentino, and then they call it Vermentino de Galora, which is a DOCG on the islands. Um, it is pressed off the skins and then cool fermented. Um, not a lot of manipulation here, just kind of fresh and clean. Um, you want to drink these wines in their in their youth when they've got that vibrancy and that energy. You can see it's got uh, wonderful acidity, low sugar, and uh, low alcohol, eight, uh, 13 percent. Um, and what I love about this wine, it's low price. I mean, seventeen ninety five. It is a home run. Uh, really delivers uh, just a, a lot of wine for the money. Uh, you can take it out to any fine dining restaurant. Oliver's reputation uh, as an importer has put him into some great restaurants. You don't see this wine on many shelves in retail, um, but you will find it in some really nice restaurants, often by the glass. Um, it's just a really good find. There are many other Vermentinos that I love very, very much, but um, because this is a smaller producer, smaller importer, that, that price is just a little bit smaller. And um, I think Quite honestly, the wine's just a little bit better. It's got a uh, little bit more more tension and more aggressive, a little sharper, and that's really what you're kind of looking for from a Vermentino. Oh, go right into the website there. Let's see if I can change that slide. And it's time for wine number two. Um, but I think we should be up to strength. I'm watching our numbers. We're still a little light. I'm still a little worried. There's some people being left behind. I'm looking into my email, making sure we're okay. And um, what did you guys think of the wine? Anyone want to comment? Yep. Hi, Ian. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I'm doing well. How are you? Good. You well, got the whole, whole family there? Well, What'd you say? You got the whole family? Yes, yeah. and friends. Yep. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. Thanks for joining us. We all love it. It's crisp and, and just the great flavors going on so in it. Two, Two thumbs up. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have any hate mail. <laughs> That's a good thing. Go ahead and say, like, it's very minerally. You can smell the mineraliness. Uh, and yeah, as you and others are saying, it's crisp, refreshing, and yeah, I enjoy it. Good job. Are you 21 yet? Yes, I am. <laughs> right. anymore. I used to be 21. All right. <laughs> good, good, man. I'm, I, you're, I'm impressed with your uh, delivery. <laughs> Thanks. So, coming to wine, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for being here, and uh, we're going to move into wine number two. Let me see if I can find that easily. And that's that. In Suave, I don't know how you say it. Yes, yeah, Suave. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if any of you remember some of the 1970s disco-y commercials mm -hmm. that were promoting Suave. But um, that, those things kind of killed this category. 
and uh, Suave is it's it be I would be a little behind or out of touch if I said Suave's back, but it is it has been uh, never really went away. It's just that the uh, the nice. big company the big company that was making the disco commercials uh, kind of stopped making that wine. So um, this is it's a, a, a sizable company, Anama. They do a great job. One of the top 100 wines of the world a couple of times recently. And uh, this is just another wine that's going to over deliver for us. And I got to um, interview the family. Now, Alessio, um, we were actually trying to get super clever. I was very fortunate to recently just go to Japan on, uh, on a little bit of a vacation. And um, so we, he was going to Japan. We were trying to hook up and and meet in person in japan but his flight got bumped out a day and we missed each other entirely so we had to organize a zoom and in fact i got to introduce uh to zoom with his father instead who was on a little bit of vacation down in um australia so these guys really do travel the world to promote their wine and so let's uh let's let's uh get in there with um his father now we're going to visit Veneto and taste the wine made from Garganaga called Suave Classico. Now in its third generation of leadership, the Anama family has been producing wine for over 40 years in Veneto. We're going to be hanging out with Stefano Inama. The family has a uh, well-defined goal to produce different wines whose only aim is to be is to represent the vision of the land despite the styles and trends of the moment. So very classic wines that have been made for a thousand years. In the 1950s, prior to uh, founding the Anama estate, Giuseppe Anama, Stefano's father, uh, began using his savings to purchase small plots of vineyards in the center of the Suave Classico region. At the time, few understood the area's potential, but Giuseppe believed that he could make a wine capable of restoring Suave's reputation by working with only top quality vineyards of Old Vine Garganaga. We are very pleased to welcome Stefano Inama, who's actually on vacation in the Margaret River. That's the beauty of Zoom, is that we could Zoom with an Italian producer in Aust uh, Australia in the beautiful Margaret River. How fantastic. Good to, good to meet you, Stefano. Good to meet you all again. Great, great to talk to you. Um, let me, let me uh, open up a slideshow. And uh, right. Right the slide will notice that that's your son, Alessio. Uh, we are jettisoning right now to Veneto. And in fact, I've got a couple of great photos to share with you. Um, here's a look at uh, the actual area. And uh, this is where Suave, this is basically Suave, right? This green line on the outside. Yeah, it's the Suave Classico. Is the ancient Roman area which has been classified as classical in the 50s. And you, the orange vineyards are your uh, land holdings. Yeah, it's our, it's our property, exactly. Yes, it's in the heart of the Suave Classico, mostly on the Mount Foscarino, which is the, uh, the center point they recognize as uh, one of the top, top spots of Suave Classico. What you've been seeing now is a beautiful cluster of ripe and garganega. That's the, 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 the name. Actually, a word about garganega, the strange name is a local dialect of bastardization of a Latin word, which is grecanicum. Your, your, your pergola system is actually coming back in fashion. As yeah. A lot of yeah. new regions are are really taking advantage of the shading. Your uh, wine features uh, an incredible texture, mouth texture, uh, wonderful aromatics, and it's a combination uh, that is produced by this extreme location, uh, volcanic soils, 
I mean, you got such incredible red, orange, look like metal rich soils. Absolutely, this is lava. This is actually uh, two phase, uh, very rich in any sort of minerals, uh, which is a, we have to keep in mind the lava is the, is the native, uh, is the native uh, uh, earth. And from there, from the differentiation of the of the lava, you obtain any other type of soil. But this is the original. These are the pictures show you ash. Many parts of the vineyards they made by compressed ash, which has been erupted by the volcanoes originally. And when you dig uh, and when you hoe, uh, what you obtain is you come, uh, you take out these incredible stones. They haven't seen uh, the light for millions of years. It's very exciting. So and the plant uptake of these minerals and it transfers straight into the wine, in the grapes, actually. <laughs> uh, this is the Mount Foscarino. This is a nice... Uh, Let me show uh, another, I'll show a couple of pictures. Uh, I wanted to get to that picture as well. You, this shows you that exposition mm -hmm. right in the heart there of the Classico. And a different angle from the top, looking down yeah. the valley. Beautiful. And again, that pergola. Uh, and if you haven't seen pergola before, it's just uh, really uh, that that it could even have it where the vines are actually kind of creating, like crossing over and touching each other and creating kind of a uh, you know, a, a top, a ceiling to the vineyard. A roof, in a way. Thank you. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Now, here's the wine that we're tasting tonight, 2020. It's a, it's a wine to drink, but it's also a wine to hold, if you like. Yeah, I have... it went Into the honey of the, of the flowers that they compose the flavor. Well, I, I love the comment here about in the vinification and maturation of non-reductive technique, which isn't quite oxidative, but um, more the way they made the wine a, a thousand years ago, just naturally picking, uh, allowing for some uh, time with colder temperatures and the skin contact. It's heritage, for sure. For sure. And I, I, I believe they were very knowledgeable in what they were doing. So the Romans at the beginning, they were using a lot of Greek varieties, and this is one of those. So you arrive originally from Greece in the night of times, we can say. Well, I want to thank you for making time for us today and teaching us a lot about Suave Classico. And uh, the Anama continues to be a great performer, a great seller in the store, but also a great performer for the world and you know gets really good scores. At a wine at that at this price point, it's a great value, but it's a real true statement of history. And I doubt there's many wines that maintain this price point, this kind of um, accessibility. Um, and and I, I I I bravo for continuing to make it so so well and to lead the the industry uh, with this wonderful uh, rendition. And we thank you. It was a real pleasure to spend this time with you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, let me finish with uh, one little sentence, you know. Uh, it's our commitment to make wine which is affordable, but it, which is not obvious and banal. And we like to describe the Suave Classico as a, a little luxury for every day. We appreciate the luxury for sure. The luxury of time with you as well. So thank you. Have a great time in uh, Australia, and uh, well, hopefully we'll see you or you're a member of your family in Los Angeles soon. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Isn't that cool? Um, yeah, this this one. I'm seeing some comments. I didn't now uh, wine. didn't have time to uh, put my post my wine review because I was kind of loving the wine so much, and uh, he was truly great to talk to. Um, uh, we actually spent quite a bit of time before we started recording, kind of uh, talking about the business and the world and uh, his travel 
Um, and then I started talking about this wine and how this wine has followed me everywhere. I have written different wine lists and different types of restaurants um, in the fine dining world. You don't typically write a wine list that's just California wines. You want to have some diversity. And uh, I've, I've been able to put this into a lot of programs that I've, I've been working with. Um, and over time, it just continues to become a better and better value because price point on this wine hasn't really changed in like 20 something years. Um, in fact, this wine may actually be uh, more affordable today than ever. And uh, um, they are a leader. They, they, they know uh, what they're doing. It's $17 a bottle and uh, 92 points. You know, it, it is distinctly Italian, distinctly got that amazing minerality. And there is some really interesting uh, mouthfeel here. Um, it's a little more rounded than say the Vermentino. So it kind of gives us like a really different wine to play with. And um, I love that that nose is super quiet, but very earth, very stone, very mineral. Um, and yet the mouth is, is pretty generous. Great price, great wine. I'll let you guys comment on there. And um, yeah, so the the two two ways we make wine are either reductive, which means no oxygen, stainless steel. They might even pick the grapes, throw some um, dry ice on them, create like a, a gaseous blanket on top of the grapes, keeping all oxygen away. Then they press the juice, put it right in the stainless steel tank bring those temperatures down and uh, just keep it super fresh. And they probably put a screw cap on it. In fact, this Anama is screw cap, but wasn't before because uh, Italian DOCs and DOCGs weren't allowed to be in screw cap. That recently changed. So the, the screw cap is absolutely perfect for a wine like this. You would not want the cork to interfere with that, all that beautiful stuff happening in the nose. And on a white wine like this, that's exactly what cork can do. So um, the screw cap's a much safer way for this wine to go. Um, and as, as far as it being uh, reductive or non-reductive, this what he was saying is that he just allows mm -hmm. uh, natural process, natural fermentation, no inoculation. And um, uh, this is just you know the way they've been making it for a very long period of time. So he's not really taking efforts to be reductive about it. And he allows uh, for the for the fruit to kind of experience uh, its time in the vineyard, be hand picked, hand sorted, and uh, then brushed. But they're not in a rush, and they're not trying to protect the wine from any oxygen contact. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a lees contact, but uh, um, it's not just straight to the bottle. A little bit of time, a little bit of a, a barrel fermentation can occur. Uh, with some other cuvées that he's making. This one's pretty much uh, pure stainless steel or concrete. And concrete has a little bit of oxygen. Um, uh, they call it micro-oxygenation as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for uh, the comments. And I'm going to continue. We're going to go into wine number three. And this one is a little different story because I made three three or four appointments to Zoom with uh, Luigi Copo in different parts of the world. Something about this time of the year, the Italians are all over the place trying to, to travel, et cetera. And every time we got him onto Zoom, there was something happening in the background. I couldn't, couldn't hear him. We had technical issues. So uh, decided to go without video and uh, present Luigi Copo myself. And we built out a little more glamorous uh, slideshow just to kind of show you. This is one of my favorite parts of Italy to visit. We're talking about Piedmont, Northern Italy, uh, very close to the French border. Um, there's a lot of French influence when you visit these towns. Um, there's aquifer systems that were set up uh, like the Burgundians were set up. It feels a lot like an old city in, in France and a lot like Burgundy, in fact. And there's a lot of Burgundian ideas they're transferred to the wines of Piedmont, things like single vineyards and crews and um, planting on hillsides and the way the, the farming is done and the yields and the expectations, the way the grapes are handled. 
even the fermentations are done in large upright wood barrels, which is often what they do in, in, um, in Burgundy as well. This, uh, this copo is called Pomeroso, and this is from a very particular appellation in Asti called Niza. And it is a DOCG, a very specific appellation and elevated. Uh, Niza is um, trying to really separate itself from being a, 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 a lower end Barbera de Asti, which is a fine wine, just fun, easy, everyday type of wine. This is trying to go for it a little bit more. Uh, first production of this wine was 1984, and they have a, a pretty a wonderful site that they know is way above the standard for a Barbera, a simple Barbera. So uh, this one actually gets 14 months in, in oak barrel and uh, really is a special uh, version of Barbera. Carries a little special, more special price. We're at about $47. Um, this would be found in top restaurants, uh, restaurants like Moza and um, a new great Italian restaurant that I love in downtown LA. If any of you go to downtown LA, it's called Hearts and Flame. Um, not a very good Italian name. I don't know where the name came from. I didn't know it was an Italian restaurant until I walked in there and it's, it is beautiful. Um, but the chef is actually worked, worked in a Michelin three star in Florence. And he brings a lot of uh, Florentine touches to this, this restaurant, makes everything himself, bread, pasta, and uh, really does it in a wonderful fashion. Not trying to be Michelin starry, but um, uh, really delivering great quality. Um, service is still kind of figuring it out. It's a new restaurant. And, but uh, if you want some of the best Italian food I've, I, that I've had all year um, in, in right here in L.A., and I'm super pumped about it. I'm trying to promote it, too, because it's right around the street, right around the corner from my house. Um, I can walk there in five minutes. So if you're coming to downtown, give me a call. I'll meet you there. Uh, let's see. Go to the next slide. And here's some uh, nice nice views of, of this particular vineyard selection. Now the family is uh, definitely famous for great Barbera um, and uh, they make a number of different Barbera and this is one of their top top end wines. They, but they also make uh, uh, some Barolo as many of the producers do. And uh, the family got started in the late 1800s. So, so here's a great shot of the family, 1892, doing it the, you know, they, they, they kind of do it all the same way. Those same, these these oak, large oak, oak, oak uprights, of course, now they're probably, uh, you know, a little more settled than they were back then. But um, all, everything is just pretty much done in the same type of fashion. Just a little bit better understanding of how everything works. Here's their barrel room. Um, really some nice use of uh, oak barrels. And this is a, a brand that you're not going to find in a lot of places. It's a little special, a little dear. Um, their vineyards are really top-notch. They've been around for a long time. They knew what vineyards they wanted to own, and they went out and got them. And um, they're very much into the heavy ethos in the vinicultural section. So uh, uh, working really hard with the, you know things like uh, composting and um, natural uh, uh, solutions, homeopathic solutions to vineyard management natural pesticides and disease control, sulfur and copper, things like that, rather than herbicides, pesticides. Here's a look at the entire family. And uh, I, I already made a commitment that we'd be visiting them on our next trip to Italy. And we're starting to work on that uh, for late in 2024. Um, mm -hmm. We love going in, no in, in November because it's right at the end of truffle season. And um, a lot of the restaurants we walk into, um, the truffle thing is kind of on the down, you know, basically they're at this point of November, they're either out of truffles or they have so many of them that they're giving them away. And um, last couple of years we've been there and they've been pretty damn generous with the truffle content. So uh, we'll be there in November of 24. 
All right, let's uh, let's get some feedback because I didn't get to taste this wine with you yet. So I'm gonna stop share, get the wine in the glass, and ask for some comments from you about how you how do you feel about Barbera? This is a, a wine that you would ever order in a restaurant or uh, go to a, a fine wine shop and look for a fifty dollar Barbera. I, I'm going to tell you in my mind, I'm, 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 I might have to be uh, convinced, you know, this is almost entering Barolo price points, but uh, then you get, get to taste it and you get this wine. that has got this fantastic color. And another way to think about a wine like this is that while it might be a higher priced Barolo, it's at the top of the food chain. So you're getting one of the best wines of a place for a price of an entry level wine from another, you know, grape variety. Barbera does over deliver big time. And these wines can age beautifully, but very few people have ever tried to do it. So this is where the Nisa appellation is really trying to separate itself. And they're starting to bring in older vintages for restaurants. This is something you're going to start seeing. Super spicy. It's got a um, really dynamic nose, lots of uh, pepper and herbs. I really love that smoky earth in it. You know, it's really nice. Mm -hmm. And then at the high alcohol too, huh? See, I feel it. Yeah, it's, I mean, for, for Italy, it, it hits a, a good 14.5. Not a low alcohol wine, but it's not high alcohol. It's not like an Amarone or anything like that hitting 16 plus. But this one's got some really good color, concentration, flavor, richness. Um, the fruit tends to range from something like a, almost like a strawberry, strawberry jam, mm -hmm. uh, rhubarb. I want to say like lush, lush density. Like mm -hmm. wine. Mm -hmm. yeah, almost like viscosity in the yeah. mouth it's really nice palate weight and this would be like fantastic you know of course in piedmont they 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 say drink wines like this while you're waiting for your great barolos to age um but i would go if i were to go to dinner or you to go to dinner with me and we went to this little place that i love uh in uh in the barolo zone we go up there we walk up the hill the wine's probably about the same price there in a restaurant as it is here, retail. Um, so you're, you, boom, you're already a winner because for 50 US dollars in Italy, you're drinking something great in a restaurant. And I'm gonna probably have this with some different types of pasta that they do make in, in, in Piedmont. Little like pasta, like little pocket pastas where they're stuffed with some cheeses, um, maybe uh, like a something like a, a gnocchi, something with truffles, something um, you could even have a, this with tartare. One of my favorite dishes in Piedmont is the Piedmontese beef tartare, mm -hmm. which you can't get away from unless you're vegetarian, right, Wendy? <laughs> I like to torture Wendy with that tartare. <laughs> <laughs> it was good it was good it was good um but yeah we've had we've had a few great folks on this zoom travel with me to piedmont and um we can't wait to go back it, it's about once every three years we try to make it back there there are hundreds of producers i've only seen the same producers maybe once or twice mm -hmm. so we always go see different different people mm -hmm. and have a lot of fun with it All right. I, if there's any more comments or you can uh, post your review of the wine. Aggressive. Yes, George. I mean, it's uh, this is a bigger, more flamboyant style. And Barbaros can, at the lower price points, be almost Beaujolais-like, kind of thin and uh, soft. Um, this is This shows you what some concentration will bring, lower yields, a little more steeper hillsides, better soils. Here's another thing to think about. Often they're planting Barbera in lesser soils because if it's great soil, they're probably gonna plant Nebbiolo, which they get a lot of money for. 
And so the Barbera gets kind of the leftover land, not with Copo, with this, and then not in Nitsa. So they're really finding the optimal spots to plant Barbera. And it's these uh, Barbera producers that are really coming out and coming for you uh, to say, hey, let's, let's move Barbera up in what you expect in Barbera. I remember uh, sitting down with a Barbera producer in Piedmont and I looked in the kitchen and every uh, person working in the kitchen was Japanese. The Japanese uh, send their culinary kids, their culinary students to Piedmont to learn from the great chefs. And this was a uh, chef Giorgio, can't remember his last name, but it was a Michelin star place and a beautiful kitchen kind of slightly open so you could see everybody in there. And it, it just freaked me out when I was sitting in this great Italian restaurant and, one, and here's the dish that I would have with it. They, they would bring out this pasta and instead of a sauce, they'd have like some fresh vegetables in the pasta and they'd have an egg yolk sitting right on top of it. And you just mix that egg yolk with the vegetables. And then they had even, uh, believe it or not, some tempered vegetables like zucchini and other things on the plate. Uh, because of the little Japanese influence that these ki these kids were bringing to Piedmont, kind of yin and yang, giving back and forth with some culinary uh, treats. So it was really cool. Asparagus. Oh, yeah. The asparagus has got to be in there. And some uh, uh, zucchini and some peas and some carrots and that egg. And you can almost keep that vegetarian there for you there, Wendy. Thanks for always thinking of me. Always trying. Just give me the truffles. <laughs> well, certainly got to shave some truffles on top of that with that egg yolk. It is so good. All right. Moving into wine number four. After a, a long, hard business week, um, this is my first sips of wine in a couple of days. And I can see, you know, wine definitely improves the way you feel after a tough couple of business days, a lot of work. We had rain yesterday and we had quite a bit of problems with the roof of the building. So the stress level has been very high. Hopefully you guys have fared better than the little uh, offices and warehouse that we're in here. I don't know if you could see it in my right-hand corner up here, but uh, came right through there. Quite a bit of it. All right. I'm going to bring you back in. We're going to go to the next wine. Can you see the screen that says Croniolo? Is that on your screen? Okay. This is what we're tasting. It's uh, Croniolo. And it is from a Tenuta Setsa Ponte. Um, this is owned by a, a very successful businessman um, who owns parts of Prada and parts of uh, um, many different industries, um, fashion being a big part of his portfolio. And uh, he has treated me very well. I visited this property uh, my first trip to Italy many, many years ago and uh, got toured around by his then uh, head winemaker, Carlo Farini, one of the great winemakers of all time in Italy. Next in our profile on Italy, we're gonna go to Tuscany and we have wine expert and Italian speaking, Sarah Klein on the Zoom. Uh, Sarah is with Cobran and they are the importer of Tenuta Setta Ponte Croniolo. Hello, and thank you for joining us, Sarah. Buongiorno. Grazie mille for having me. Croniolo and Setta Ponte have always been very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I think this wine is a constant overachiever. And I think it's one of the, like, you, it should be your go-to Italian, joyful, kind of super Tuscan-inspired uh, and it's a it's a wine you can open any day of the week um, and pretty much any vintage because 
it's so dependable. And this is the brand new 2020 that we're tasting. Just got 93 points from James Suckling. Uh, Sarah, tell, yeah. tell, us, tell us what you think about this wine. We got a little PowerPoint for us. So we'll... Yes, I think um, kind of the new and unique thing about the wine, since it's been in existence since 1998, that with the 2020 vintage, it is officially designated organic. Oh, so wow. Yes, the new for the 2020 vintage for both that and the Oreno and eventually the other productions from the estate, uh, they will be officially classified as organic. And we're in the Chianti zone with this wine still, because that's a big zone and there's a, a lot of area that can be considered Chianti, right? Correct. So we're going to be, if we were to be in Florence, we're going to go east towards the city of Arezzo. Um, it's famous for the movie Life is Beautiful, if you remember uh, that movie. Yes. Um, so yes, we're in what we call the, the Valdarno, the Valley of the Arno. So it's, you know, much flatter land. But as you can see, just in the background, you still have good elevation with the mountains that what we call the Holy Arentini, the Arentini Mountains behind. Nice. And what else is unique about the area is we have this bridge here that was built back in 1277. And it's very famous in the area for several reasons. It's one of seven bridges that cross the Arno River as you travel to and from Florence to Arezzo. Uh, the other famous one is the Ponte Vecchio in Florence where all the gold is sold where, you know, if you've made, paid a visit to Florence, you've certainly walked over the Ponte Vecchio. And if you were to travel from Florence, you eventually would get to their estate coming over this bridge. And it's also famous for its seven arches. We have this theme of seven for here. Um, the estate is located off an old Roman road called the uh, Via di Sette Ponti, the Road of the Seven Bridges, and ultimately just, you know, one of the importance of, of the key of seven here. Perfect. And what's nice is, yes, this estate was purchased back by the family in the uh, 1950s, but the previous owner was Vittorio Manuele, one of the last reigning kings and part of the Savoy family, a very noble family, and they had planted the Sangiovese back in 1935, and it's some of the oldest documented Sangiovese in the area, Ooh. and it still yields fruit. They do have a production under it, but it's also what has provided the, the cuttings for all of the Sangiovese on the estate. So, you know, you could consider it to be heirloom Sangiovese piccolo. Beautiful. And what's unique about here is, yes, they get lots of sunshine very favorable. They still get the cold weather that they need just for the Sangiovese. It does like that. Um, they do have the, the galestro soil, the, the limestone that is particular to the area. And what I love about Cronyolo is the fact that it is Sangiovese based, 90%. Uh, it has this little pinch of Merlot in there. And, you know, oftentimes people think, oh, Super Tuscans have to have Bordeaux blends only, or they can't just be, you know, predominantly Sangiovese in this way, which actually they can be. And I think it's even more appealing because it's, you know, has high acidity component being naturally of Sangiovese, but it has this nice plushness that's rounded out, out by the Merlot that kind of gives it more of that ideology of like a, a super Tuscan in that sense. And yes, we, these are some of uh, where they do the aging. They use, like to use French oak. Uh, we do a combination at Sette Ponti between new barrels, second year and first year passage. So, you know, we like to do they do, I should say, <laughs> the Moretti family, as much work as they can in the vineyards, you know, and, and the least that they need to do when they get to this point um, with the barrels. Uh, what's nice about the estate is it's about 750 acres total, but only 150 of that is planted to vine. So, you know, it's relatively a smaller operation in that sense. Um, they definitely are using, you know, some of the best of the best that they can get, whether it's, um, you know, agronomists or enologists, and they've had Carlo Ferini consult with them in the beginning, you know, one of the legendary super Tuscan creators, you could say. And yeah, this wine has always just been, you know, ex expected every vintage of what you want it to be. I would say it never kind of like comes under par, even if it's like on a warmer vintage or a cooler vintage, it really just is uh, consistent with how it's made. Um, Croniolo is the name of a type of a, a little bush that grows on the tree or grows on the estate, excuse me. Um, you know, there's always meaning to something for the names, especially when you have Italian wine labels. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I, I got to visit this estate and um, have lunch with the family. And this was many, many years ago. Um, and it, this this brand, Tunitsa Sense Ponte, has blossomed into one of the star brands in the country. Yeah. It's kind of their, um, I don't know if this is the entry level, but this is the wine that is like the ambassador wine for the property. And uh, I can't recommend it enough. I think, I, again, dollar for dollar, this is just a real overachiever. And it's there's a softness and a plushness and a and a uh, it still stays truly Italian, but it gives you so much more access. I think that the style, the way the the farming, and now that uh, organic designation is nice, uh, nice plus for this for the future. And uh, yeah, this is just something you need to know about and experience. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. And it's going to be a part of our program, you know, going forward for sure. And we sell a lot of uh, Croniolo. Um, we've carried it every vintage and we're going to have a nice big uh, stack of 2020 here. And I think our price is right on being uh, as competitive on this price as you can be. It's a, it's a, it's a wine that a lot of people will carry, but, and you'll see it in some great restaurants as well. Um, so I would I would be a participant in this one if you like it look for it uh, grab some from us when you can and um, thank you Sarah for presenting yet another beauty uh, from your portfolio is great you again grazie my pleasure and, and we'll talk soon okay thank you ciao ciao ciao. <laughs> and I didn't get to work with Sarah Klein when I worked at Cobran. But uh, she's tremendous and super savvy on the Italian wine world. She's worked in the Italian wine business for a long time. And um, $36.95. And this is uh, kind of in a nice, nicely sandwiched between kind of a Chianti Classico Reservas that kind of cap out around $30. And maybe as you enter into uh, Brunello de Montalcino or Rosso, uh, de, uh, the Rosso de Montepulciano, um, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I really like this wine. Very generous, easy to love. And quite honestly, it doesn't have to be Italian food. Um, you could have this with a steak dinner. Um, and like I put in the chat box, I said, if I, I own a steakhouse, this would probably be a great by the glass. Before we go into... Uh, the Multipulciano di Abruzzo. Any questions or comments about the Croniolo wine number four? Thumbs up. Good. Thank you, Kelsey. You gave me two thumbs up. Feeling good about that. Emily Little, you doing well? It's so good to see you still. Thank you so much for being here. Lisa Test. Always great to see you. Hi, Susan Ryan. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, Brian Grossman, always great to have you and your wife with us as well. Thank you so much. You know, um, when uh, the pandemic ended, um, we, we, we saw a lot of businesses move away from Zoom and going back to being open. I really love the format. I love being able to, you know, do this casually with you at home. Um, uh, pushes us here um, and, you know, allows us to taste some different things with different people. And it complements our lives ev live events really well. And I know some of you come and see us on live events and on Zoom, and some of you can't, where we also send these boxes to place, far away places like Florida. Um, I think Florida's on the Zoom. Anyone on the Zoom from Florida tonight? I know I sent some there. Um, there you are, Cedric. Thank you. <laughs> Where in Florida are you guys? You're representing tonight. Yeah, we're representing uh, Miami, I guess, here, yeah. I think there's actually a, another uh, box in Florida. Um, Trevor, are you Florida as well? Came on camera just as I said that. 
from LA, but we attended some of your events. So we invited Cedric over. He's, oh, good yeah. man. I'm a referral. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's good. <laughs> I want to just recognize a couple others that join us often. We've got Gary on the Zoom um, in Northern California. Um, Setsuko, who when I was in Japan, I got to meet Setsuko. Super, super great. And uh, she's a wine professional, owns a wine bar in Tokyo. And uh, it was great to meet Setsuko, from meeting her on Zoom first, and then meeting her in person was particularly sweet. And um, seeing some other names here, we've got the Chapmans down in the South Bay. I got both of your phones on there, Steph. Dave's on his iPhone too, maybe? <laughs> cool. We've got some great folks on the Zoom that are about to go to Sicily with me um, at the end of next month, and uh, got some just great news. We're going to go see uh, this fantastic producer called Acapinti, and um, Stanley Tucci just interviewed her, and we get to hang out with her at Acapinti. In fact, we're going to stay there now, so that's super cool. Yes, yes. All right. Well, let's go to kind of the star of the show tonight. Um, I, I, I would love to just kind of see by, by before we even get into this wine, how many of you have tasted uh, an Emilio Pepe before? Any of you? This is, uh, this is special stuff. Um, Montepulciano di Abruzzo is not necessarily the place that, you know, is super famous and super hip and trendy. Um, this is pretty old school, but this family has done it so well for so long um, that their uh, wines are just completely sought after all over the world. And they, they're smart. They release the wines in different age categories at different prices, and they continue to take those prices up every single year. And so we're looking at um, our, our financial investment tonight in this Zoom, and I'm hoping it doesn't disappoint. I'll look forward to getting through the uh, slideshow here and seeing how you uh, rate the Multiple Chiano di Abruzzo from Emilio Pepe. And we go back to Oliver McCrum because, wow, what an important brand to import. And he is the importer. All right, we're back with Oliver McCrum. And we're going to now taste a, a great red wine, a classic red wine, a collectible, if you will, from Italy. And I think it's interesting that... Uh, this wine has become such a cult favorite. Um, and I'd love to get your, you know, look at it because I'm not sure how long you've been importing Medio Pepe. And I'm not sure how many people in our audience maybe haven't been made aware of this brand, but this is truly like a, a, a culty wine that those that know about Medio Pepe just cherish this brand. And um, the wines, age like sleeping beauties and uh they uh we are able to show off a 2012 in this program which I'm, I'm super excited to have something with some age like this but you know give us your perspective of Emilio Pepe and why are they so culty and what is it about them that's so special I, I think that <clears throat> Um, it's a good question. You know, why do, why do some wineries just really catch the the um, popular attention? Um, I have to say that uh, I think that the main reason here is, as it should be, is that the wines are um, outstanding. Is one of the is in fact one of the best wines, red red wines made made in Italy. Um, the wine is is made of the grape variety Montepulciano. This is slightly. Uh, confusing uh, in that there is a um, a hill town in Tuscany all with the same exact name called Montepulciano, but there's no, as far as I know, there's no connection between the two. Montepulciano here is just the name of the grape variety, and the Abruzzo is the um, 
the region of Italy, which is sort of like their states um, that it comes from. Uh, and of course, Emilio Pepe is, is the producer. Emilio himself is probably uh, 80 now, maybe older, but still uh, absolutely active in the winery. They uh, one of the nicest visits that uh, that I know of in in Italy, Italian in the world of Italian wine, is to visit with this family in uh, Toronto Nuovo. They uh, they have a a, a tiny um, hotel. My yeah, maybe it's like a mini hotel with I don't know half a dozen rooms or something. Uh, they have a restaurant there, and so you can actually um, stay there, and you can really kind of soak up the uh, the character of the place. Uh, three generations of the family are now um, uh, responsible for um, uh, running the winery. Emilio, as I, as I say, is still very involved. Um, they're made in a very traditional manner. Um, the uh, grapes are, the red, the red grapes, uh, the Montepulciano grapes are destemmed by being rubbed across a, uh, a grid, kind of like a wire mesh grid. Uh, which is the old-fashioned way of doing it, which I've never seen. Um, uh, I've never seen in my time, other than in photographs of the the old ways of doing things. Um, and then they are. Uh, they also use for both the red and the white. They use um, cement uh, for fermentation and aging. Cement tanks and um, cement is um, a material for making tanks that was. Um, very common um, in the early part of the last century, first half of the last century, maybe. And then it became uh, deeply untrendy. And then as, as happens, it is now once again, extremely trendy. Uh, Emilio Pepe has never made the wine any other way. So he's uh, uh, hasn't changed at all. And uh, fashion has caught back up to him. And he's now, he's now trendy again, both their reds and whites for um, some years under the um, the cellar, they have a, a big aging room uh, and they um, age the bottles. This is actually this photograph here, you can see in the foreground is one of their main uh, vineyards of uh, Montepulciano. Uh, and then the building with the arches um, that you can see there is the hotel and restaurant, the arches. Uh, um, and this is a bunch of old wines that, uh, that date, date back to the 70s. And they uh, keep the wines uh, until they're, uh, they feel that they're ready to release. They release a range of different wines. Yeah, just striking, fabulous wines. They, they, they give the lie to the idea that um, age-worthy red wine has to be aged in wood. Uh, this is only aged in cement. I would drink it with, um, particularly with uh, lamb, with red meats typically. Or, of course, uh, roast chicken. The famous wine writer Hugh Johnson once said that if the wine is the main thing for your dinner, then roast chicken is a great choice because it shows off just about anything really well. Fantastic. I, I, I do uh, see this wine on some top Italian wine lists here in Los Angeles. Uh, Absolutely. Bestia, I believe this wine's over $400 on the Bestia wine list. These wines, they have them from various older vintages and they continue to elevate in price point depending on how old the wines are getting. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really a great, a great find. And, um, and when you open a bottle of this wine, it typically is uh, extraordinary. Yeah, and I think the fact that they age the, the, the when you when you drink the, these wines with say in this case, more or less 10 years of age, um, you're you're getting wines that were aged at, at the cellar. This is an opportunity that, um, I mean, anybody who's had much um, experience drinking older wines knows that the condition of older wines is not um, is 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 one of the key points. And the fact that these wines is going to be in in good condition and the overall hit rate of these older Pepe wines um, is much higher than 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 would normally be the case price uh, of, of this wine is well deserved um, yeah i think so well it's always great to learn from you and to visit with some really cool brands and i thank you for your time today uh, it's a pleasure ian anytime hope you guys are enjoyed the show thank you for the opportunity to chat with your customers as well
as you spend a little time with this wine, it just kind of continues to show different dimension. And um, yeah, tobacco, damn, that's that's the next thing I was gonna say. Um, it's like, um, you know, it's like you walked into a real masculine, you know, library of books. And you get that leather and you're smoking a cigar and you're, you know, smelling, incredible cuisine and um uh, it just really i think it's like personifies the italian stereotypes of great red leather booth restaurants and uh, frank sinatra probably on in the background you're looking at 189 dollars now i know this wine is worth more than that already online there's um, quite a few people priced 10, 20, 30, 40, $50 more. Um, when you go to a restaurant, you're going to pay probably close to four to $500 for this bottle. Um, uh, I buy these in small quantities and I buy them directly from um, OM. Um, and he offers them out and kind of limits you. So I can, I you know, if, if you don't put all your money and in inventory into $200 bottles of multiple channel di Abruzzo, but it's nice to get, a, you know, six or eight or 12 per year. And um, <clears throat> we uh, showcase a, a few of these at a couple of events throughout the year. Um, and we've had a couple of different vintages and we even sell the white, it's called uh, Trebbiano. And it is, uh, it is really, really fantastic as well. Before we head into our last wine, just going to see if anybody else has any any more comments about that that wine, good or bad. Was it a, as exciting to you as it was for me to be able to present that? It's mixed. It grew, it started to open up and grow on me a little bit. I could see it with some um, rigatoni pasta and a, like a spicy arrabbiata sauce, but you know I wasn't loving it. It wasn't my favorite Italian wine. I drink a lot of Italian wine, so it was okay. I know I should say something different, but yeah. Lisa's moving to Italy, so that that's something. Oh, um, I, I actually uh, at first smelled some notes of burning rubber, which ah. took me a little by surprise, but um, we... We happen to have some gorgonzola cheese with us, and it actually goes really great with the gorgonzola. It would be great with gorgonzola. Yeah. Yum, yum. Cool. Natalie loved it. Rob and Brooke agreed with Natalie. Um, I did a dinner a couple of years ago now, 17, um, at uh, Felix restaurant with. Um, the daughter, her name is Kiara. You can see my lovely prints, but they really went all out and made these beautiful posters. To kind of, uh, remember the night, Emilio Pepe wine dinner at Felix Trattoria. And um, uh, we had several different vintages, both the red and the white. And just really does take on an incredible personality with great cuisine. And uh, that's why you'll find it at so many fantastic, iconic restaurants. We'll move into uh, our last wine of the of the show, wine number six, and another wine to kind of get to know about because this is a relatively um, new category. Um, it is called. Select uh, Grand Selezione, and it is a uh, basically Chianti's answer to the pressure that they're under by Brunello de Montalcino and wines like Crognolo and everything else that's kind of capping how far people will think Chianti can go. So on this particular video, which um, I got had the pleasure of being hosted by. Alessandra Cassini, who is absolutely a, a goddess. She is spectacular, beautiful, and 
runs the winery with a iron fist. And um, uh, so I got to go to Chianti and stay at her beautiful castle, which you're going to see in this video. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, Master Sommelier Josh Orr is also featured in this uh, in this video. And if it looks familiar to some of you, uh, we actually used a video that we uh, made with them uh, back. It was probably one of our very first Zooms. So uh, let's visit with them. I'm going to try to get the slide to cooperate. Give me one second. My screen is having all kinds of problems here. I'm going to stop the share and bring it back up. Okay, now I got the video. Um, I described the new Zoom technology like when iPhone updates come and nothing works anymore. It's kind of the way the new Zoom technology is so great to improve the product. I just wish it worked. Here we go. I'm very excited to have on our Zoom this evening, proprietor of Bindi Serengardi. Uh, that is Alessandra Cassini Bindi Saragadi. I'm so envious of your four names. It's a, such a wonderful name. Yes, well, first of all, thank you, Yin, and thank you also, Josh Orr and all the broadband team for making this happen. I'm very, very happy to be with you. And there's a little video that we'll play to kind of take us to your property. And this is Mochi and Yin. And we have a little music underneath. Okay. So that's my car right there, right in front of the house. And that's the little guest room. If you go to visit them, they have guest accommodations. And then that's all the wine cellar back there. Mm. And here are winemakers, uh, Stefano Di Blasi and uh, Federico Cerelli. The Grand Salar Simone, which is, uh, um, can you? Grand Selezione. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, yeah, you were talking about the new appellations at the beginning, and Grand Selezione is one of the uh, great projects of Chianti Classico. Uh, they kind of pushed the boundaries of Chianti Classico, that was sort of set within boundaries that said, no, 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 we need to go a bit more up. Uh, and, and Gran Selezione has been an excellent way of proving it because it really gave the possibility uh, to many producers to say, okay, we're going to make, uh, uh, very often they're single vineyards, um, a very special, unique wine that the market will recognize as a very special and unique wine. And, uh, and, and so it has been. Almost everybody has 100% Sangiovese in uh, the Gran Selezione. We have an 89 stands for the plot of land uh, where the vines are grown. So it's to say it comes from the specific uh, vineyard. We produce only uh, seven, not even 7,000 bottles of this wine, so it's a very limited production. Uh, but it really, again, expresses uh, uh, the land of Mocheni, especially because this specific vineyard 
is exactly where the two type of soils of Galestra and Alpereze meet. So you really do get um, both type of soils within that single vineyard that gives both structure and minerality. Do you get a, what do you get on this wine, Josh? And Gran Selezione, as you as you and, and Alessandra insinuated, it's a category that's only been around. Um, the first vintage that had it on the label was or was allowed was 2010. Um, and so it's a newer category. And then also, as, as she said, it has to be a state fruit or um, fruit that has been in long-term contracts. So you've been buying fruit from them for whatever, 15 years. Um, not something that you can say, hey, I just got this great vineyard two years ago. I want to start doing Gran Selezione, Selezione from it. Unless you own it, there it, it's not going to qualify. And so it, there's a lot of limiting factors in terms of what you can produce into Gran Selezione to make it that, as you said, kind of Grand Cru quality. And so this, for me, has a lot of those secondary characteristics, that cedar and kind of pencil lead character, um, certainly some leather components to it. There's some warm, um, like, uh, balsamic -y tones. Um, there is the fruit goes from like a fresh note with the the 16 um, La Guerlanda to a little bit of dried as well as tart cherry. There's even some plum and um, you had notes of black cherry, but that's in my head for some reason at this point. But the licorice -y tones are consistent. Is definitely a textbook um, that could teach us all. And I, Josh, I just want to thank you now for all the kindness um and the time that you give us um but of course uh, thank you for giving me a reason to open some good candy you bet ciao everyone thank you very much grazie <laughs> grazie and ciao ciao now a couple of years ago we we weren't super smooth at uh editing um and probably still aren't but uh even more so back then so apologize for the chop chop on the video, but um, this is a this is a elevated Chianti Classico. It is uh, um, not only from a very old vines, a very special vineyard site, single vineyard, but uh, the way they're handling these wines is really much more elegant in their in their poise. Um, they're they're very long aging. The wine that we're tasting tonight is a 2015, and this the optimal drinking window has yet to really arrive. It's probably right around 10 years. Um, unfortunately, there's no more 15 left. Um, so the, these wines are, are things for the seller, but you could certainly use them anytime you're going to drink a great Chianti, but you could elevate a, a dining experience. Um, potentially, you'll be out at a great restaurant looking at the wine list and seeing Gran Selezione. This, these are also um, you know, part of the Chianti Classico area. So they carry that black rooster as well, uh, signifying that they're Classico. Um, and this is just a really refined spot. Now the, these vin vineyard designations have to be approved by the Chianti zone as Gran Selezione worthy. So they submit their wines for approval and uh, get approved to be marketed as a Gran Selezione. Um, you're looking at a, a slightly higher price point for Gran Selezione, probably between 50 and $75 um, for the Chianti wines. Um, when we produce these events, we have different types of response. We sold a number of bottle kits and we thank you for joining us with bottle kits. We also thank you for joining us with the tasting kits. But we only have a couple bottles of a couple of these wines left. The uh, looks like we have about two bottles of the Mosini Chianti Classico Selezione. If you're interested there, I have four bottles of the Medio Pepe remaining. We have plenty of the Setta Ponte Crognolo. I currently have twelve in stock, but we uh, have another order coming in. Uh, the Anama is one of our best sellers in the, and will continue. Uh, we'll probably roll right into the 21 vintage here with our next order. And the Mancini is fairly new to the house. It is a fresh 2021. And the Copo is a 17. And um, I only have six bottles of that remaining. And in fact, uh, probably that's the last six bottles of 17 anywhere. Um, because they're, they're already starting to market the 2020 wines from there. 
Um, if you'll allow me, I will go from here to show off a couple of our upcoming activities at Zoom into Wine and hopefully get you excited to join us again very soon. Um, once a month, we put a little bit more um, uh, work into creating these multi-winery events and scheduling the different appointments with the wineries. Some of them will come and see us live or uh, Zoom with, with us from their home. Um, but whenever we go to Europe, we're pretty much having to schedule these videos or work with the importers and have them live on the Zooms. Um, next week, though, we're doing a, a, a nice overview on some great finds from Spain, kind of in the value category. Um, we were unsuccessful with our Napa event. Uh, I, I picked some really expensive wines, and uh, they're very rare and probably not well known enough to pull this one off. So we have pulled it off uh, of our selection. Uh, we were at $150 a tasting kit because there was a $750 bottle of Realm in that tasting. And if I can't sell uh, quite a few kits, uh, that doesn't make any financial sense at all. So we, we went ahead and made the cut. Uh, so the 29th, we're gonna be dormant, but we'll be back the week after with two very successful programs already. This is um, an opportunity where you can either buy the tasting kit and the wine glass or just the tasting kit. Um, the wine glass itself is made, it's a hand blown crystal glass from a brand called Zalto. And it looks just like that. And it is spectacular to hold. The, the feel of this glass is just incredible. Um, and we'll do two events back to back, once on the 5th of April and once on the 12th. Again, you can do the kits are very affordable and the wine quality here is exceptional. Because as even Mr. Riedel said, if you're going to drink a $100 bottle of wine, you probably want to have a $100 wine glass. And that's kind of what Zalto also is a competitor of Riedel, albeit. But uh, uh, these Zalto glasses are really spectacular. So we wanted to give you the right wines to use to really see how a Zalto performs. Um, so check out the wine list on that link or go with us into Bordeaux. Um, and uh, check those out. And we literally will deliver one kit and one glass, if that's what you wish. Um, a kit combo, flight kit and glass, uh, 140, 134 for Bordeaux and 134 for Burgundy. So um, good, good value either way you want to slice it. Our big program, our next big program will be with Rioja. And in fact, we are... Uh, going to make a large number of announcements here in the coming days, as we have the president of the Rioja region who's helping us produce this show on Rioja. And when you have the president of Rioja giving you her time, and she is dynamic, incredible, educated, and very much a historian on the region, she'll be basically hosting this event. <clears throat> Plus, we'll get the producers uh, to record some sessions and tell us about their individual wines, but I'm picking just off the Richter scale, high quality Riojas. They don't, they're not all super expensive, but they're probably a little bit more meat on the bone than your basic Rioja. We will have a few of those too, um, but I'm really showcasing some Riojas that'll make you purr. They're really going to be special. So Rioja will be extra, extra. And, um, uh, we're, it's going to be a great deal. So check it out. Um, uh, I believe if we were going to sell out a Zoom, this is the one that's going to sell out. Okay. So be on the lookout for it because it's going to go and we can only have 60 people on, on the Zoom. So uh, we hope that you'll uh, uh, look at that and join us. Um, while I'm in um, Sicily, we're, go we're going to be uh, dark for that week. But then the week after we come back with a great presentation on rosé and these are the best in rosé worldwide so uh check out the rosé presentation that'll be in may it'll be a, the perfect timing for it and the lineup of rosés that we're showing is really really top not top notch absolutely um then we'll go into a little study of sauvignon blanc and i'm going to come back with some sicilian uh, information and share that with you, pour that out on the 17th of May um, as we do a study on Sicil Sicilian wine. 
And then we'll finish up the month of May with a, a, a wonderful lineup of Argentine producers, because at the end of this um, year, we are going to go to Argentina in October. We're going to hit Salta, Buenos Aires. Uh, we'll taste in uh, Mendoza. And then uh, a few people may join me as we go down to Patagonia. Um, so traveling hard this year, doing some amazing stuff. Um, had a couple of years to think about what I wanted to do. And we're trying to uh, really milk 2023 for all it's worth. Um, um, so uh, we get back from, Rio, uh, from, from uh, Argentina in October. And then we barely put our bags away because we're going to Rioja and Ribeiro del Duero in northern Spain uh, at the end of November. We always travel the weekend of Thanksgiving. We tell you, th have Thanksgiving with your family, have your leftovers on Friday, uh, get on a plane on Saturday, meet me there on Sunday. We get started for a week, the first week of November the end of, uh, or first week of uh, December, the end of November, um, that's going to be the weekend that we are in uh, Northern Spain. And we're going to go from Bilbao to San Sebastian, uh, down into Rioja and uh, into Ribera. And I've done this trip before. Um, there are some fantastic places to visit. Um, and there are some places I haven't been yet either. So we're working on both sides of the fence there, but uh, we're going to get some amazing uh, uh, energy uh, because people love it when Americans come, wine-loving Americans come to their wineries in, in faraway places. They take really good care of us. So with that, I, I salute you guys for joining us tonight. I'm going to stick around and uh, talk to anybody who wants to talk to me, comments about this event or anything else. Uh, but I want to thank you and... Uh, Thanks for taking this little journey with me to Italy. Have a good night, everybody.